Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Our guest from New York City are two creators of children's books, Tom Feelings, the illustrator, and Muriel Feelings, the author. Seated beside me is my friend, Priscilla Holton, the self-proclaimed Philadelphia agent for Tom Feelings. Before we get to know this couple, notice the posters by Mr. Feelings that serve as our backdrop. Some have a setting in Africa, as do these examples of his illustrations from children's books. Bola and the Obaz Drummers, a story in Nigeria by Letta Schatz. Tales of Temba, traditional Bantu stories by Kathleen Arnott. Eleanor Hetty's When the Stones Were Soft, East African Fireside Tales. The Tuesday Elephant by Nancy Garfield is the story of a boy in Kenya and his elephant whom he met on a Tuesday. Also in Kenya, Zamani brings a gift to his mother in Zamani Goes to Market, the book written by Muriel Feelings. Here a fisherman sets traps in the Congo River of Mystery, nonfiction by Robin McCown. The other books have pictures laid in our own country, from a quiet place by Rose Blue, Matthew cherishes a book in the solitude of the library. In Song of the Empty Bottles by Osmond Malarski, Thaddeus plays a prized guitar obtained by collecting empty bottles. Now I have the pleasure of introducing some distinguished guests in our audience. The assistant coordinator of the Office on Work with Children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, Ms. Helen May Mullen, Professor of Children's Literature at Drexel Institute of Technology's Graduate School of Library Science, Ms. Rosemary Weber, colleagues from my own College of Education, in English Education, Dr. Florence Scheinsman, and in Creative Activities, the artist, Mrs. Jane Revell. Last, but far from least, Muriel Feeling's own mother, Mrs. Irwin. Most of the other members of the audience are my Triple T students, trainers of teacher trainers, an urban-oriented doctoral program. First to ask questions from this group will be Ms. Frances Grant, Mr. Sam Black, Ms. Annette Lopez, and Mr. Jim Tokley. Now I'd like to begin by asking the two of you, Muriel first and then Tom, what are some of your publication plans that have not yet been realized? Well, we did a second book together um, called Moja is One. It's a Swahili counting book. And uh, this time also illustrated, as I said, and the second um, book that is forthcoming also sometime late this year is a Swahili alphabet book. Uh, Muriel, you are an artist in your own right, aren't you? Yes, I have been working, but not recent years. <laughs> Do you have any plans in the future to well, illustrate your own work? Well, I hope to when we uh, go to Guyana to get to do some of my own work, not particularly for illustrating, but I would like to work in the graphics, printmaking area, because that was, that was my, my forte. I've been teaching mostly in the last few years. Would you tell us something about these plans to go to Guyana and what you expect to do there in terms of publication? Well, we're both going. Um, uh, Muriel will be teaching uh, art in school. I'll be working with the, the Guyanese government as an illustrator, illustrating their books, children's books and some textbooks. I see. And do you not also have a book uh, that you expect to issue soon called Black Pilgrimage? Uh, yes. Uh, it's in production now. It'll be out in a year. 
it uh, spans uh, 10 years of work that I've done, uh, drawings from life and paintings from life, uh, done in the black community, starting in the black community, starting a 10-year period where I started for the first time drawing completely in the black community, uh, then the South, and then Africa. It included uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant Bedford in New York? Bedford-Stuyvesant, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Louisiana, and then uh, the two-year period that I spent in Ghana. What media did you use for black pilgrimage? Uh, well, the drawings were, were done in pen and ink and pencil and wash, and some of the things were later painted. But uh, as I said before, these are things that were done uh, on my own and they're being put into a book, I've written the text for it. Uh, did you not also use a tissue paper <coughs> format for an, a number of your illustrations? Discuss that technique. Uh, well, the tissue paper was something I decided to do when I came back from Africa. Uh, I had, I do line drawings when I go out in the street and draw, but uh, what I wanted to do was to breathe something uh, into the, the illustrations for books that, um, that went beyond the craft of line drawings. Uh, what I wanted was a contrast of, the same kind of contrast that I saw in Africa, contrast of hot sun to black skin. And I wanted the children to, to see and feel this same contrast that I saw and felt in Africa. On almost every page in Zamani, the sun appears. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, because that's what I want the kids to feel. I felt that walking around Ghana, uh, the sun was always there, the whole presence of warmth was always there, and I tried to project this in my artwork in the, in the books. You mean warmth in human beings, too, warmth as well human as, being as and temperature. Warmth in the sun, yeah. uh, Priscilla, it's your turn. Well, I must say that it is a, a real privilege for me to know Tom and Muriel. Uh, you introduced me as being the, Tom's uh, self-proclaimed agent. And uh, I offered my services to Tom some years ago, <laughs> but he never took me up on it. <laughs> so uh, I am an art lover. Uh, I certainly am a lover of children's books because most of my adult life has been spent in working with children. So anything that has to do with children that's for the joy and for the education of children has its appeal to me. Uh, I first uh, became acquainted with Tom's work about 12 years ago through a publication, uh, Freedom Ways. And I cherish those prints that came out many years ago. Uh, I might say that I am very privileged to have an original copy of Tom Fielding's work in my home and also an original copy of Mrs. Fielding's work that she did when oh. she was a student. A beautiful collage and lovely orange and greens that go with the decor in my living room. <laughs> so I, I really feel very privileged and I'm very proud and uh, uh, also, I am privileged to have Muriel's mother as my dear friend. And often when uh, Mrs. Irwin and I are out together, people uh, begin to question as to just uh, to whom does Muriel belong, <laughs> because we are both uh, <laughs> tooting our horns so. Uh, I might say about the books, uh, the, the sun, to me, Tom, uh, is like a trademark in your work, because it is so prominent. Uh, and Tuesday's Elephant, uh, Mrs. Irwin has an original copy of the painting from Tuesday's Elephant, which is just lovely. And the sun is so brilliant. And, uh, and we had said that, you know, in every picture you see the, uh, the sun, and it's almost like a trademark in all your work. I had not uh, thought of it in the terms that you discussed tonight, and I think that it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, you uh, bring this part of it out, that the sun, the heat, the warmth of friendship and devotion. In preparing myself to be on this panel, I did some reading and I uh, read something from one of our foremost scholars, Dr. Du Bois, uh, that was, uh, he was talking about the absence of, of uh, literature from West Africa. Uh, the written, and uh, one of the things that he said was because of the intense heat which occurs the sun and the rain, it was very difficult for a written word to be preserved. 
and I, I the, so, so that the sun has played a very important part in uh, Africa, and that you were depicted in your work certainly I think is a tribute to you. He has depicted it in, in a poetic way too. Yes. Uh, uh, a last question: When you go to Guyana, do you plan to develop uh, trade and textbooks? I plan to do anything that will help the. Uh, the uh, people of color there. Guyana is made up of East Indian, Africans, and Chinese. I plan to do any kind of, use any kind of functional art, posters, uh, books, in any way that would help them to develop their country and point out the fact that they are a cooperative government and that the people should cooperate in order to, to build up such a government. And do you not also have some plans to develop uh, the talent of native artists. Yes, yes. I, uh, I want to show them that they can move into the field of illustration and in some way do as what I've been trying to do here, give back to the people what they have been given. I wonder now if we couldn't hear from the Triple T <coughs> students beginning with Miss Frances Grant. This is Phil. In your book, The Man Who Goes to Market, did the incidents that you write about, did they actually happen to a young boy? And if so, what were some of the incidents? Uh, no, that isn't uh, based directly on an actual experience. It's based on uh, what I did was try to convey the collective impressions I got from having visited <coughs> various rural areas that had common cultural features. The built-in kind of... Um, uh, cooperativism and organization of village life, which I found characteristic in uh, Congo, in various parts of rural Uganda, Kenya, the, the southern Kenya, which I visited. The places where I visited, I found that uh, it was characteristic for children to express respect for elders in a certain way, kneeling, uh, the uh, other, other, any, any other kind of mode of respect was very similar to what I found, you know, in various places. And the uh, division of labor, where the children perform certain functions according to sex and age group. They work with certain parents. For instance, it's characteristic to find mothers working with their daughters and fathers, sons working with their fathers. And uh, the acceptance of responsibility of children meant that they were coming of age, so to speak, such as Zamani. Uh, was coming of age to take responsibilities for taking a calf to the market means that his father has a certain confidence in him. He's reached the age where his father feels that he can take the responsibility of leading an animal to the market. And uh, the closeness of family life, the sense of humor that, uh, that, the pe that, that people have, and uh, just the hospitality that I felt in all the places that I went where um, I was, as any, as any visitor, particularly someone uh, of, being, of being of African descent, I was given first and foremost whatever, you know, which is the cu their custom. The visitor gets, you know, first and foremost what they have. And um, I was taken in very much as a family member, and I, particularly in Kenya, where I was inspired more so because I stayed longer in one place, in one village, that, um, uh, I was felt very much a part of the family, and that was the basic inspiration for the book. Not a particular, not, not, nothing exactly like that happened, but all during the two year stay, I've seen children going to the market with a certain age, boys doing things with their fathers and so forth. There's other things that appeared in the book. Also, I think that something is very important. We, uh, my wife and I both lived in Africa. Uh, she was in uh, Uganda for two years, and I was in Ghana for two years. And we both had an experience where a lot of the stereotypes about, of Afri about Africa that we had read about a scene uh, were proved untrue. And what we wanted to do was to share our positive experience with black children here in the States. And one of the things that we, we felt we should share is we wanted them to have a comparison like we had, you know. And one of the things we felt we should share was the fact that America is not the world and that there are black children outside of this country that um, have whole families, mother and father, that have relationships between their mother and father and children and the rest of the people in a communal way. 
and uh, we thought this was very important to, to show in books. And up to that point, uh, uh, none of the books that I had illustrated showed this as much as I wanted to be shown. Uh, so I said to my wife, she complained about some of the books, why don't you write it? Exactly. Good inspiration. Sam Black. Yes, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. and Ms. Fields a question that I don't know whether they would appreciate, but I think I should ask it. Uh, you have been dealing mainly with uh, uh, illustrations and pictures and books of people of color. Do you think in the future that you might be persuaded to, uh, to be more commercial and try to uh, approach other groups or other aspects of uh, uh, other areas of uh, writings and illustrations? Or do you think that you have enough of a market in working with the people of color of various background experiences? Well, not in the, I will, if I may comment on that, I, uh, it, it would never be a question of whether the market was there. It was a matter of what, what is needed. And um, I have, I think that we can take up our whole lives with doing just this because there'll never be enough. And um, that's our main interest, that's our main concern. And I don't think there's any necessity for going past that. Well, the, the, up until about uh, five years ago, uh, uh, before that, I'd always wanted to do uh, children's books for black children, but I couldn't get any work. I couldn't get any work only about five years ago. They started doing a number of books that dealt with black children. And for a very long period of time, I had to, to use so much energy just trying to uh, say and trying to get people to understand that it should be normal and natural for me to do black books as it is normal and, and natural for Chinese in China to do Chinese books or Africans in Africa to do African books. Uh, I don't even think you have to explain it. Uh, may I say something here? Because uh, I would like to recommend the January edition of The Instructor. There's an article in Language Arts uh, by a teacher from New York City, and it's called The Invisible Child. And really, prior to the 60s, uh, in children's literature and even basal readers, the black child was the invisible child, you see. Uh, he was not depicted in the books. He did not see himself in the books. And it, uh, with the rise of uh, HEW and OEO, when there was a major thrust into the underprivileged areas and taking advantage of the, uh, doing something for the disadvantaged child, uh, publishers began to pay attention to these areas because that's where the money was, you see. And then the black child became alive and became a part of our literature. So that as far as the feelings are concerned, I think that we are very lucky to have a couple who are willing to devote themselves to an area that has really been forgotten in American literature and children's literature. Exactly. Annette? Yes, sir. I'd like to ask Mrs. Bailey. You mentioned that you have taught in Africa and that you do teach, or you have been teaching here in New York. Could you briefly expound something upon the differences in the educational systems? Uh, well, I taught in uh, Boys High School in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. And one of the first things that um, struck me was that I had to radically change my diction <laughs> and my spelling. <laughs> uh, I had to spell color with a U because they had uh, been trained in the European English and um, King's English, and uh, that I had to adapt my way of speaking to be understood. And uh, I found after a while when I you know, that I, when I came back here, everybody said, you have an accent. It's because I had to change my way of speaking to be understood. And um, I hope I haven't gained back that accent again. <laughs> Pull off the accent. And uh, one thing is the children there, because the edu education is an important uh, thing, they value education. I didn't have any discipline problems uh, worth mentioning. And um, I, was, I had much more time to do things that I wouldn't have been able to do here, for instance, to have a, a workshop on Saturdays. And mm -hmm. the students were from all parts of the country, and many of them did not live at home, except those students who were, few students who were from Kampala. And they could come at their leisure, and we'd spend all Saturdays in the art room and put up erected uh, stone sculpture in the garden in the school, and we did a puppet show for television. I, all these things I could never have done here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it was just ample attitude, ample uh, opportunity to do anything that you could see where there was a need to do for them in the most part. The only th uh, uh, thing that I found uh, that disturbed me was the fact that the Cambridge system, which is uh, the East African governments are trying to gradually abolish, is the Cambridge system of education where um, the students go on from one level of education to another only by passing a Cambridge examination. And that was a high school, senior secondary school as they call them. And there I seriously doubt I could have passed that examination. It was like a third year college, college examination. And um, the uh, pressure is so high and, and, and tight on the students that if they don't pass it, they don't go to college. So they're gradually, when I was there, they started an East African examining board. The curriculum had begun to change because uh, during colonialism, the British had only taught European history. The students had not been trained in African history until the year before I came, when they, well, a few years before I came, when the country became independent. And uh, they had an African history program. But um, by and large, I mean, all these things can be changed once a country has gotten control of its own educational institutions as well as all other factors in a society. And I saw the potential was so great. Um, I didn't have to deal with uh, students who had emotional problems, which made it much easier to get more over and to deal with them. And uh, we had a very good working relationship. Um, so many things that can, we can, you know, compare. But basically, the drive for education is just fantastic. The students uh, who were from or were from very poor um, would study under very adverse conditions if they didn't have a hostel. The government had put up hostels for students to stay in, like dormitories, and um, as many of those who could be accommodated, because the government did a fantastic job of putting up schools. Because prior to independence, there were something like ten schools in the whole country during colonialism, and the schools had multiplied rapidly, but still there, you know, was a need for many more and more facilities, but they were growing rapidly. Mm -hmm. Muriel will claim you, even with your Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Very proud to have you. Uh, Jim, your turn. Uh, I fell in love with a book, To Be a Slave, by a Jew, especially. And uh, the reason why I fell in love with it was because I feel that we as black people need a book, you know, that tells it like it is from the beginning all the way up to the present, and a book that both, you know, children as well as adults can read. When I read the book, uh, it did many things to me. It, 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 it's a very emotional book. And uh, I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Felix, uh, after reading the book, uh, that is, you know, without the illustrations. What did it do to you? What, what emotions you know, did it bring upon you? You mean what I had to go through when I read the manuscript? Yeah, what you had to go through. What, what, you know, how did it mean you? I went back from slavery. Uh, you see, for uh, a seven-year period here before I went to Africa, uh, what I was trying to do was uh, show some beauty that I felt was, was in black people. Uh, but I had a problem because something kept getting in the way. And it wasn't until I went to Africa that I realized that what kept getting in the way was the conditions that black people live under, you see. And when I got to Africa and yeah. saw where the, mm -hmm. the, the, the conditions of black people live here in America, but when I got to Africa and saw where the beauty came from, then when that was solidified, it made it easier for me to then deal with the pain. Easier, you know, but... Uh, so when I came back here and got the, this book to do, uh, To Be a Slave, uh, when I started working on it, I had to actually go back through slavery, you see. But because I knew that what I had felt down deeply about black people, that they are beautiful people, I could deal with the pain. Honestly, as much as I could. May I comment about that? He didn't think any piece he turned out when he was working on it was any good. He was, he just, because it's also because of the fact it was for Julius Lester, whose work he appreciated, the quality of the work in the book. 
every piece he did, he just he just wouldn't believe me because he thought I was just not objective, you know. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until really after he did the final pieces and turned it in, and Julius Lester called him and said, you know, I just can't explain how grateful I am to you for what you did. That he really, really believed it. He just, it was the idea of wanting to put this thing down so perfectly. Mm -hmm. Everything he did, he just wouldn't believe it. It's <laughs> also something else. It was the first very book painful. after ten, ten books. I've done ten books on Afro-American situations and African situations. And that was the first book that I did that was written by a black person. And it is the runner-up to the Newberry. No small feat. Miss Mullen, there's time to include you in part one. Right. Uh, having worked in both the United States and Africa, do you approach your work for the two countries in a different manner? Uh, what I try to do is, 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 is put down what I feel, and in some cases I let what I feel take over. Um, I have mixed emotions about the things that I do here that deal with the, the American situation because it is not as clear as the African situation to me. I was in a different environment, an environment that, that I like. Uh, maybe I can best express it by, there's a poem by a, a black teacher, Ruth Duckett Gibbs, that says, uh, Ghana boys, Nigerian boys, Liberian boys, they all have problems too, but being black in their own country is not one of them. Miss Webber. I'm very much interested to find out whether or not you think that one of the reasons we haven't had many books about the invisible children is because we didn't have black artists to illustrate. Not, uh, I don't mean that there weren't black artists, but I mean that they weren't asked to illustrate no, their own books. I walked around with portfolio for, for, from 1960 to 1964 mm -hmm. to every publisher it was in New York, the same publishers are now giving me, giving me work. Yeah. And I had a portfolio that had all black people in it. You see, what happens is after a long period of time, when somebody tells you that they don't want you to do something or you shouldn't do this or you should completely lose yourself, and then you don't have, uh, when they discourage you, and then you don't see any black artists, then people say there never were any. Mm -hmm. There are more black artists now mm -hmm. because they are beginning to find out that they want to do things that involve them, that, that have something to say about them. No, that, what I'm really saying is that what I did find out in Africa is that all that I really felt down deeply about black people is true. We can do anything we want to do. I might add to that because, uh, and also extend an invitation to you sometimes with Dr. Shack to, to come to my home, which some people consider almost a gallery. And in my home, there are hanging paintings of some originals, and I'm very happy to say, of black artists that go back 25, 30 years. And, and, I, and uh, Philadelphia artists, John Queen, Charles, Charles Smith, oh, they're just dark, thrash. You know, these men were painting for years and, uh, and beat it, you know, beat the uh, Wharton Center at 22nd and Columbia has had an art center, um, uh, Mrs. Irwin, uh, whose uncle, John Harris, is in the art department at Cheney, have exhibited for years. John Harris, Father Harris, her uncle. You see, it's, it's, uh, it's lack of information and knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, that, uh, and this type of information, unfortunately, was kept from the whites in our society, mm -hmm. so that you grow up in, in through high school and through college, and you feel that, well, there just aren't any, uh, you know, artists. Uh, uh, other than uh, singing and dancing, that was, that was just it, you <laughs> and know. And basketball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, uh, you know, it's really unfortunate that uh, we've had to, but this has been our burden, and uh, we have carried it well, I must say. Uh, and, uh, but it is coming through, and certainly there's a wealth, just in Philadelphia, of black artists. Thank you very, very much, Mr. and Mrs. Feelings. Good luck to you in Guyana and East Africa. <laughs>